the general routine was you had an initial point, they called it, a specific geographic point on the ground. You would turn then and go to what they call the AP, the aiming point. And as you went toward the aiming point, the uh, bombardier would get his Norden bomb site, which was an early model of a computer. He would get it organized so that he'd say left, left, right, right, up, up, down, down, whatever, to get the pilot and that that um, computer going together. The Norton bomb site was one of the U.S. Air Force's most secret weapons. This early computer calculated altitude, airspeed, and crossroads to determine exactly when and where to drop the bombs. And so when you get to your point and you call the pilot and say, okay, I have it, and you go straight and left, and you look in front of you and it looks like thunder clouds, it's black, it's uh, dirty, uh, you feel like, and you almost could, that you could see the Germans at their gun positions. Then we would go on through, all we could do is just sit there, like this, because the airplane was being flown by that computer. It's a moment of truth, where everybody has to stop wiggling around, trying to evade the flak and wade through. You lean over and when you do, you go to the eyepiece and you're watching the crosshairs that are moving. And you stop them and that means you've corrected to the ground speed and when they get together, the bombs are gone. The minute he'd say, bombs away, then boy, we had our hands on the control. Sometimes both of us would be, you know, getting it into whatever direction we'd pre-planned for the breakaway. Time stands still. <laughs> Trust me, it's, it's a long, long run when it really is probably three to four minutes, five minutes, but it seems a lot longer than that. For the crews of the Marauders, it was no easy ride. We had done our job, dropped, dropped the bombs. We counted some flak and some fighters, but my airplane didn't get hit. And uh, we were all assembled and going back to our base. But on one mission, one of the marauders was hit by flak and unable to rejoin the formation. We were supposed to all stay together, and if guy got crippled, it was his tough luck. But I didn't dare. I didn't want to do that. This guy was out there by himself. He could have been picked off. But I got close enough to be tightened up for defensive purposes to take a look at him. Well, he was flying straight and level, trying to keep it going, but he had to fly slower because he was crippled. So I had a camera there that we all had that if something unusual occurred, you could use a camera if you weren't busy fighting off something. And while the other guy flew the airplane, I took this picture myself. I noticed what was wrong. Both engines were moving, but under, underneath, there was a big gash in the left wing. There were holes all along the side of it facing me. This airplane flew all the way back it was some, it must have been about 150 miles or so that he flew back with me on his wing. He couldn't make a normal landing. He made a belly landing. Got those gear the wheels up and skidded in. Nobody was injured inside, but the airplane was really wrecked. The Marauder was capable of surviving severe punishment, but once wrecked, it was a valuable kit of spare parts. If it hadn't been for airplanes belly and in, we would not have made it. That was our spare parts airplanes belly and in and as soon as we we had a crew of people that went over and took parts off the airplane and said had them put back in the storage so we could have them when we needed them. In terms of belly landings as being a source of a possible crash, nobody really worried about that. We could skid that daggone thing right in, whether it was on mud or on a paved runway or not. And if we had to do it, we'd do it. And in fact, most people would rather make a belly landing than get it up there and bail out and let the airplane fall. In the first three weeks of operation in North Africa, the B-26s of the 319th Bomb Group had flown just 20 missions. 10 aircraft and 40 men were lost. Now, it was the B-26s combat losses that were called into question. Within weeks, 
American forces in North Africa had joined the British 8th Army in defeating the feared German Africa Corps. The Air Force continued to experiment with a B-26 bombing at different altitudes. But soon they realized bombing was most effective between 10 and 12,000 feet, exactly the height the B-26 was originally designed for. The first three or four missions, we, we went from the deck up to about 3,000 to 4,000, 5,000. Still wasn't enough. But very soon we learned uh, that you had to get up above 7,500 feet to be safe from the kind of anti-aircraft, light anti-aircraft flak that they threw up at you. You knew you were going to be attacked coming out of the target area. So you had to get back into tight formation quickly so that your gunners would have the mass effect for the German planes who were coming trying to attack us. They'd like to have us scattered out and pick us off one at a time. And uh, so we didn't, uh, we didn't want to have that happen. The B-26 Marauder had proved to be a tough and durable aircraft. We had them come back with half the tail shot away and, and uh, engines shot out. And, uh, 26 would absorb a lot of, a lot of damage. It just seemed to me like that that engine was well built. It would take a lot of beating. We had occasions where engines were shot out. Uh, oh, we've been beat up any number of times uh, where you get damage to the plane. Uh, there are even occasions where the crew, parts of the crews were killed. The plane came back. The Marauder was quickly earning a reputation as a deadly precision bomber. In January 1943, Winston Churchill persuaded Roosevelt to continue with the Mediterranean campaign to force Italy out of the war. Their goal, to draw German forces from the Russian front and prepare the ground for the invasion of France. In the Allied invasion of Italy, Martin's Marauders would add another deadly chapter to their history by taking part in one of the most famous and controversial conflicts of the Second World War, the Battle for Monte Cassino. By 1943, the change from low-level to medium-altitude bombing, combined with combat experience, helped turn the tide for the Marauder crews. Bombing missions were increasingly successful, but flying into enemy flak was always a terrifying experience. We could look ahead, and I remember saying to the uh, pilot, I nudged him, I said, what in the hell is that? He looked at it and he said, you've seen flak before. I said, that's flak? Well, here was this solid black band with red flashes all through it. Well, the Germans had already picked up our altitude, direction, and everything else. So they were just laying a barrage into our flight path. And I don't know how we got through that. I mean, you can almost walk on this stuff. It's big black puffs. And when you have one where your airplane shutters, that means you done got to go on some of this stuff. When you could see flak, then it was reasonably close. When you could uh, hear it, it was very close. When you could smell it or feel it, it was terribly close, within 40 feet of you. Well, that's what we felt all the way through that black cloud was the aircraft just bouncing and the smell of cordite or whatever that powder is. Uh, we could feel the stuff, we could hear it, we could smell it. I was there as we were on the bomb run before we got to the target and we were getting an awful lot of flak. But pieces began to fly off of our lead ship. They were bouncing off of us and uh, it was a scary experience. I had to try to keep straight and level while we're going trying to get on our target. But uh, in doing that, and uh, worrying about the first of flak that was coming all around, uh, all of a sudden, I found a, I, there was a bump on my head, bang, like somebody hit me with a hammer. And 
knocked my uh, goggles flying and whatever else I had on my head to protect my, my skull. But uh, this was a sudden shock. And what had happened was that a piece of black came right through plexiglass, right straight ahead of me. And of course, if I'd have been done like our, my grade school teachers used to say, sit up straight, uh, Conlon, I'd have been dead and I would have gone right through here. Fortunately, I was a little slumped and it went right through here, grazed the top of my scalp, but it hit hard, drew a lot of blood. It was a shock, it was a, it was a surprise, and I knew, was, uh, I didn't know how bad it was, and then, but I was not unconscious, so I, I could still function, but I had to get this blood stopped, and so the, the next thing happened was someone was bandaging me, and the other guy was flying the airplane, till we could get uh, back out of this flak, and, and fighter, fighters were now coming in too. I had a whopping headache for the next day, but other than that, I, I was okay. The Allied invasion of Italy was launched in September 1943. In an attempt to hold the threatened city of Rome, the Germans constructed a series of defensive lines. The last and most formidable, the Gustav Line, was anchored on the heavily fortified garrison town of Cassino. Strategically, Monte Cassino is absolutely pivotal. It's a formidably strong mountainous area right in the middle of the Gustav Line, which protects the direct route for the Allies to take Rome. Now, what had happened in early 1944 is that not only had a direct assault on the Gustav Line failed, but the Allies had tried to get round it by going to Anzio, and that also had stalled. So, one way or the other, they were going to have to solve the problem of Monte Cassino. Throughout the weeks of heavy fighting, the sacred monastery of Monte Cassino had been left untouched. This 5th century monastery, founded by St. Benedict, was internationally renowned as a place of holiness, culture, and art. But the Allies suspected it was being used as a German base. In a highly controversial move, the orders came to destroy the monastery. And of course, all the Catholic people and all, all totally freaked out because you ain't supposed to do that. You know, it's a, it's a shrine. Well, it ain't no shrine if the Germans are in there with machine guns killing our boys. Gentlemen, we all know the purpose of this operation against Casino. The timing works like this, sir. The attack will be opened by medium bombers, beginning with the B-25, the tactical air force. Then come the heavies in waves at 15 minute intervals. Following the heavies, the B-26s will complete the attack. And uh, during the briefing there, I say we had a Catholic chaplain get up and ask if any Catholic present, and there were some, you know, in every group, and the next question was, do you want to go? And if you don't want to, you don't have to. Yeah, but the Pope said, give them hell. So we did. The sky was full of every kind of aircraft that I knew of in the whole uh, southern European theater. The B-17s, B-24s, the uh, P-47 dive bombers, the Spitfires that we had covering us, the P-51s that had just come in. Everything was in the air. The Germans were firmly entrenched. As the formations of marauders approached Monte Cassino, the skies were ablaze with flak from the German guns. We are getting shot up pretty good, but you see, the pilot, he don't see a lot. In other words, he goes up there on the lead ship. Now, he flies the airplane up to this bomb run, and at that point, the Norden bomb site takes over. Well, I remember seeing the casino. It was a white building sitting up there, and to me, it looked like a white picket fence, you know, around it. And we made our bomb run, and as we was making our bomb run, uh, we came in and we uh, dropped our bombs, and I could see them exploding from one end to the other of the casino, and nothing but dust underneath there. On 
February 15, 1944, to the shock of the world, the monastery was leveled. The accuracy of the B-26's bombing proved without a shadow of a doubt that if used properly, Martin's aircraft was a potent weapon. It was solid stone, you know. Them friars built a heck of a... <laughs> Heck, it was tried. They, that wall on that thing was six, eight foot thick. We knocked it down to rubble. We went twice a day. So we finally knocked it down and killed every German big enough to die. The Germans, after we bombed, they come out of the rubble and still holding it, so the British and the Americans both uh, had a hard time taking it, even after we blew it up. The bombing of Monte Cassino was a tragedy. Now, ironically, the bombing itself worked reasonably well. The B-26s did a good job, the bombing was quite accurate, and the monastery itself was leveled. The Germans then occupied the ruins, and the Allies simply weren't able to get them out of the ruins. Thus, although the bombing worked in the short term, the Allied operation to smash a hole through the Gustav line failed. The destruction of Monte Cassino was a turning point for the Marauder. Its combination of speed and handling, the Norton bomb site, and the quantity of bombs it could deliver had created a formidable machine. The Marauder could now deliver bombs on a dime. You're watching the Mediterranean campaign in the fall of Rome. The B-26 Marauder and its crew's reputation was growing from one victory to the next. Despite its notorious birth as the flying coffin, the Marauder was proving to be an outstanding airplane and feared adversary. The improved bombing accuracy and switch to medium altitude tactics meant that the Marauders had now come into their own. But D-Day would provide the Marauders with new challenges the B-26s were called upon to soften up the enemy in an intense pre-landing bombardment. They played a key role attacking German troop movements, communications, and defenses. Marauders of the 9th Air Force fly over the invasion surface fleet past the beachhead to strike at enemy concentrations. And when the Allies invaded southern France, the B-26s helped neutralize the heavily fortified southern French ports of Bordeaux and Toulon. Designated as a fortress by Hitler, the port of Toulon was dominated by hundreds of shore batteries and anti-aircraft guns. If the harbor was to be captured, the guns had to be destroyed. From 10 to 11,000 feet, we could put 90% of the bombs in the 600-foot circle. We could hit the target. We could defend ourselves and hit it and get back. In 48 separate missions, and with a loss of just eight aircraft, the Marauders dropped one of the most concentrated barrages of the war. Never before had the Marauders ability as a precision bomber proved so effective. On August 23, 1944, Toulon fell. The Allies' successful campaign continued across occupied France, and by August 1944, Paris was liberated. Now with Germany buckling under, the Marauders were deployed in bombing enemy defensive positions on the eastern side of the Rhine, and destroying the enemy's road and rail networks. In the final months of the war in Europe, the B-26 crews were flying a record number of missions, often under heavy attack. The much maligned medium bomber now had a reputation for flying into battle and achieving pinpoint accuracy. The Marauder was also admired by its crews for its strength and ability to take intense punishment. Towards the end of the war, on a bombing mission across the Rhine, B-26 bombardier Charles Mews had an experience he will never forget. We were just uh, 20 miles or so from Strasbourg, and we took a hit. 
then the next hit, uh, the guy I think was in the Bombay. And at that point, we realized that we were hit. We were not going to make it. It was chaotic. You know, neither neither engine was doing what it was supposed to do. We had fire. I could see the fire. You know, there was no mystery about it. The co-pilot was uh, sitting, trying to get out, uh, which he couldn't. Uh, but uh, his parachute strap had caught on the seat. Uh, the release to the co-pilot seat was between the pedals. I could reach it. I did reach it. I pulled her sideways, and he went backwards. After successfully releasing the co-pilot, Muse was able to make his own escape from the bombardier's position. So we got the co-pilot. He was the first one out. We got him through. The top turret gunner was dead. The tail gunner and radio gunner made their dramatic escape by bailing out past the landing gear, leaving just news and the pilot in the plane. We were trying to debate whether or not we would stay with the plane because we could see the Rhine River and we could see safety and home. We finally got to the point saying, no, 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 we're going to gonna take the way out and out we went. I remember the tremendous quiet as you're hanging on a parachute, swinging gently in the breeze, you hope, and everybody's gone, everybody's left you. I was not heroic. I knew when I was caught, and I stopped and promptly showed my hands and stood still, and so then, then it was taken prisoner. Muse was captured along with the rest of his crew. They would spend the next few months as prisoners of war. In May 1945, victory over Nazi Germany was complete. By the end of the war, the record of the Marauders was outstanding. Its bombing accuracy had made an important contribution to winning the war in Europe. The B-26 had made aviation history with an enviable record for survival. Its actual combat losses were fewer than any other Allied bomber in the war. by its reputation as a widowmaker from cradle to grave. This remarkable plane was tragically buried without the military honors it so richly deserved. With the war over, the 500 remaining B-26s were blown up and used for scrap. Ironically, the aluminum was collected to help rebuild the devastated German metal industry. I would say that considering its birth, when it came out and how many people it killed, it was a bad airplane. Now, as we learned to fly it, and as the mechanics learned to maintain it, it became a good airplane. It had holes all over the airplane and still it was flying. Come home on one engine and fly almost the whole distance on it. And that was a pleasant surprise. And so that, we kind of loved that airplane after seeing what it did for us in so many missions. That was probably one of the greatest aircraft we ever had in the military in those days. In terms of its ability to take a terrible, terrible beating, and that was one thing that made it uh, tenable for us to fly that airplane and keep on flying it, because we knew that sucker would bring us back. You know, it might be hard getting back, but it would get us back. than a speeding bullet and unlike any aircraft ever built it raced the sun and won flying at speeds of 2,000 miles per hour in the top one percent of the earth's atmosphere it holds every major speed and altitude record for a jet you did all of this effortlessly and that was the feeling you had that you had control of so much power it was the world's first stealth aircraft flying over enemy territory and photographing 100,000 square miles of the Earth's surface in one hour. You were sitting at the very front of that 107-foot-long spear penetrating enemy airspace. You were truly the tip of the sword. If anything went wrong, we would be on the 6 o'clock news. 
Using archive film and color reenactments, Heavy Metal reveals the once secret and covert world of the SR-71 Blackbird. During World War I, the first reconnaissance aircraft were developed to photograph the enemy in order to gain a tactical advantage. By World War II, advanced aircraft and camera technology played a vital role in the Allied victory. After the Second World War, the world was left with two ideologically opposed superpowers. The Cold War had begun, and the United States wanted to keep a watchful eye on the events behind the Iron Curtain. America was desperate for information about Soviet nuclear stockpiling, fighter capability, and bomber threat. In December 1954, the task of creating the next generation of reconnaissance aircraft was assigned to the visionary designer Kelly Johnson and his elite team from Lockheed's advanced development program known as the Skunk Works. I think Kelly's uh, operation of the Skunk Works was probably unique in, uh, in the aviation industry. To start with, he had a very, very small cadre of people. He handpicked everyone that worked for him. They were swore to ultimate secrecy. There was absolutely no leaks within the system. He was guaranteed of that. He also made it a point to co-locate his engineers and his producers, the people who were building the airplanes, so the engineer could come up with a drawing and he would walk out on the hangar floor and talk to the man who's bending metal. I can't stress enough the engineers directly with the shop people all the time. And Kelly, when you had a problem, he'd have a meeting and decisions were made right then. He was always very fair. He could be very tough. Uh, he was no pussycat, I'll tell you. Kelly's Skunk Works produced their first spy plane in 1955, the U-2. In an effort to evade Soviet radar, the U-2 was designed to fly at an altitude of 75,000 feet. In 1956, it began flying over the Soviet Union on reconnaissance missions. But the Soviets' latest radar systems were more advanced than had been anticipated. When the U-2 flown by the CIA first began their operations over the Soviet Union, they were shocked to discover that the Soviets were tracking them even on the very first mission. Every U-2 flown over the Soviet Union was in serious danger. The U-2 was being tracked and that was a great concern to not only to our country but to Lockheed who had promised that this airplane would never be seen. Determined to create the ultimate spy plane, Kelly Johnson returned to the drawing board. He began designing a new supersonic aircraft that could fly faster and higher than the U-2 with the lowest possible presence on enemy radar screens. Then, on May 1st, 1960, disaster struck. A U-2 flown by Francis Gary Powers was shot down by an SA-2 missile. Powers survived and was put on trial publicly by the Soviets, both to humiliate and deter the U.S. from carrying out any further reconnaissance flights. But with tensions between the superpowers mounting, the need for reconnaissance was more urgent than ever. Kelly Johnson's plans for an advanced supersonic spy plane became the number one priority. To create an aircraft capable of operating at the speeds and altitudes that Kelly envisioned, his Skunk Works team would have to overcome a series of huge technological problems. And the biggest problem that he was going to face, and he knew this up front, was going to be temperature. The temperatures that the aircraft would encounter at those speeds, phenomenal. It was clear that a traditional aluminum airframe would not withstand these extreme conditions. You could not fly an airplane past 2.6 Mach 
and you just barely make it in with aluminum because the airplane had just turned to jelly. They chose a different metal alloy, titanium. Titanium was both light enough to reach altitudes in excess of 80,000 feet and strong enough to withstand the enormous temperatures generated by Mach 3 flight. No one had ever built an airplane out of titanium. So he had to begin from scratch. We didn't even have tools that you could use to develop titanium and to bend it and to shape it and to make an airplane. So we had to start by designing tools. It was a gigantic undertaking. Creating an aircraft able to cruise at Mach 3 was difficult enough, but the Skunk Works also had to face the challenge of combining this level of performance with a new science of stealth. To avoid features that would create strong radar reflections, the plane had taken on a revolutionary shape. The wings were blended into the body, and the long surfaces on the forward fuselage were designed to deflect incoming radar waves. So were the inward angled twin fins, the pointed engine cones, and the nearly flat lower fuselage. Also, they developed a special radar absorbent plastic, or composite, that was incorporated into all the leading edges. When you look at an SR-71, 20% of what you see is composite. You know, it's just unbelievable at that time. And it was developed in our shops. An SR-71 was a hundred times smaller radar return than an F-14, which is only half as big and was developed 10 years later. So that was a really, truly first airplane specifically designed with stealth in mind. On December 22nd, 1964, the SR-71 was rolled out onto the flight line at Lockheed's Burbank plant, the Blackbird. Coated in black radar-absorbent ferrite paint, the Blackbird was an extraordinarily futuristic-looking machine. Lockheed test pilot Robert Gilliland would be the first in the cockpit. When we got going, as a matter of fact, um, for the actual first flight, it had 383 open items. Uh, these are things that are supposed to be working that aren't working. So it was a bare bones type of operation for the first flight. And you might say uh, these kind of things could be dangerous, but there are plenty of other people that would like to have been in my position, I assure you of that. The acceleration when we made the first engine run and they had those afterburners going in there and that thing is straining against those cables and I just felt, boy, this is really gonna be something. <laughs> The flight lasted just over one hour, reaching top speeds of over a thousand miles per hour, a phenomenal accomplishment for a first flight of any aircraft. Kelly Jutz was there and some of his guests were there, and I don't remember who all else was there, but the whole kit and caboodle were very happy, including me. It seemed that Kelly had created his ultimate spy plane, but would it be able to evade radar? And could it fly high enough and fast enough to escape the Soviet fighters and missiles? Let's go, let's go, get in here, troops. We're coming to you live from the Gulf. So tune in, maggot. Mail call. The new season begins tomorrow night on the History Channel. Fourth of July. of Mach 3 at altitudes over 80,000 feet, the SR-71 Blackbird was the fastest and highest flying jet in the world. In 1966, the first SR-71 spy plane was delivered to Beale Air Force Base in California. The first strategic reconnaissance squadron now needed an elite force of airmen to fly it. 
Well, my first thought was, I sure hope that I'm selected for the program. I mean, that was that was ultimate, to get selected for the program. In order to qualify for the SR-71, you had to be very good at what you were doing thus far in your aviation career. In fact, you had to be pretty much the best at what you did to be considered as a candidate. Each Blackbird needed two crew members, the pilot and the RSO, the reconnaissance systems officer. It was extremely exciting to uh, get to get signed into Beale Air Force Base and to think that you're going to be flying this airplane. You cannot wait. But the selection interviews and evaluations alone lasted a week and included a rigorous physical examination, the same exams the astronaut corps endured. And the first two days were physicals, an astronaut physical uh, in a sense, taking a, an EKG on a treadmill and full body x-rays, just very extensive physical exam. They also wanted to know if you were the kind of person that they could live with on the road because you had to spend a lot of time together. You know, in a sense, it's part of your family. And they wanted to evaluate people to see if they'd be a good member of that family. The pilot began his actual training with long hours in T-38 and in the SR-71 simulator. The intense simulator sessions tested the crew members to their limits. They basically made it a grueling experience. They would just give me uh, multiple malfunctions to deal with. In fact, they just keep giving you another problem on top of another problem until you're juggling five or six or seven balls at once. And eventually you have to start dropping them. And they would evaluate how you prioritized which ball do you drop. After months of training, the crews were ready for their first flight together. The extreme speed and altitude called for special protection. This came in the shape of a $120,000 pressure suit. Two technicians scoot you up, you step down into it, you put your arms into it, and it comes up to your back. The boots are separate from the suit, and uh, they're re just regular, real uh, combat boots. The gloves are especially handmade for you, and they snap on with little O-rings onto your suit. Then we put the helmet on, it's quite heavy, and once they snap it down, you hear yourself breathing. You get, uh, for, for a few moments there, you get some claustrophobia. I did anyway. The suit was designed to have 100% oxygen in the nasal cavity area and then compressed air in the rest of the suit. So that if you were to lose cabin pressure at 80,000 feet or above, um, the nitrogen bubbles in your system would come out and your blood would boil. So you need some kind of an environment around you. That's what the pressure suit provided. Suited up, the pilot and RSO are ready to be escorted out to the aircraft for their first flight together. There are three people that do nothing but strap you into the cockpit. And unlike a lot of aircraft, this cockpit is down sort of in the bowels of the aircraft. You're, you get placed down inside the cockpit and strapped in. And then the, the canopy is lowered on top of you. You don't even lower it yourself. Someone has to do that for you and lock it down. You're kind of becoming part of the aircraft, and it's becoming part of you. A shot of triethyl boring gas ignites the fuel and the J-58 engines are started. Where it really got impressive is when it starts taxiing out of the hangar. And it's 110 feet long, and so this thing keeps coming out, keeps coming out, keeps coming out, and all of a sudden you realize that's an awesome-looking airplane as it gradually comes out of the hangar. Here we were looking at an airplane that was going to be going 2,000 miles an hour, and its design was so futuristic. It was like no other airplane that had ever been designed because it was going to fly in an environment that no other airplane had ever been in. I never forget how it feels to light those afterburners and feel one light before the other one does, and it jerks you pretty hard. And it accelerates rather rapidly a matter of seconds, you're, you're hitting 180 knots indicated airspeed, lifting off at 210, making sure you get the gear retracted before it overspeeds at 300 knots. 
and you keep pulling that nose up to try to achieve uh, the 400 knot climb out. And in less than two minutes from brake release, you're pulling out of afterburner, you're level at 24,000 feet. It's, uh, it's quite a ride. I remember the first time I took the aircraft up to speed and into altitude, I went through Mach 1, and then I approached Mach 2, and it went through Mach 2 without the slightest uh, indication of any problems, and I marveled at that, and then it rolled right on through Mach 3. Of course, none of us had ever been that fast before, but you did all of this uh, effortlessly, and that was the feeling you had, that you had control of so much power on this aircraft it was almost limitless. As the SR-71 accelerates through Mach 3, the triple sonic boom is followed by a blast of heat radiating from its black skin that reaches temperatures of 1,100 degrees. It truly flew through the air like a hot knife through butter. It really did. So it was pointy on every end, but it had elegance. But it was an elegance that was designed for performance. SR-71 crews were ready to go. Flying over heavily defended areas in enemy territories would push both the aircraft and the crews to their limits. On March 21, 1968, the first SR-71 operational sortie was flown out of Kadena Air Force Base, Okinawa, Japan. The Vietnam War had been raging for five years, and the United States was determined to defeat communism in Southeast Asia. The role of the SR-71 would be gathering photographic and electronic intelligence of the enemies. They would fly daily over territories where one mistake could cost the lives of the crew and provoke an international incident. In this program, the, the margin for error was so narrow, almost to nothing, that it really was the pressure of flying the mission flawlessly. So that because if anything went wrong, we would be on the 6 o'clock news. SR-71 missions were always carefully planned. In their briefings, the crews thoroughly studied the mission route and surveillance areas and were warned of any potential enemy threats. Well, we tried to stay well informed about our adversaries' capabilities, about uh, their, their ability to track our movement, our aircraft, any potential surface-to-air missiles that might be a, a threat to us, or any aircraft that might be a threat to us during a flight. Three hours before each mission, the crew had a medical checkup and a high-protein meal of steak and eggs. The crew chief and his staff spent hours inspecting the SR-71 for any possible mechanical problems. Pre-flight on the aircraft starts around midnight. We're staying for a 6 or 7 o'clock launch in the morning. And uh, there's a lot of procedures that you go through. Cameras have to be uploaded. The bays are in the forward section of the chines and then the cameras was electrically lifted up into it we always loaded a light load of fuel for the mere fact that it's a lot easier on the airframe it's a lot easier on the tires the landing gear and so forth like that there's always excitement in the air electrifying every time you fly the airplane it was everybody was keyed up everybody did their job and did it extremely well and took it very very seriously everybody worked together and it was a team effort, and uh, everybody knew that they was uh, striving for that one thing, and it was perfection. The uh, SR-71 demanded it because uh, there was no room for error. When you get ready to launch the airplane there, things are happening so fast that uh, you send the airplane off, and of course you're going to be concerned about whether or not it's going to come back. You're constantly thinking whether everything is correct or not, and those questions kind of creep into your mind.
2,000 feet, the crew would switch off all contact with air traffic control. Only a select few knew where the Blackbird would go next. The pilot in the SR-71 spent all of his time flying the airplane. The airplane operated on autopilot, that's true, but you had to kind of hand fly the autopilot. It demanded your attention all the time. And so the fellow in the back seat, the reconnaissance systems officer, he held all of the auxiliary systems. Sitting in the rear cockpit, the RSO must keep the plane on the black line, the pre-planned route to the target. As they reached enemy territory, he concentrates on the radar and defensive systems, trying to jam enemy communications in the event of a missile launch. We carried the same type of jammer that was used throughout the Vietnam War by uh, all of the fighters and bombers, which attempted to jam the communication between the radar site and the missile itself. Once they began the communication, our indications in the cockpit would go from warning to jamming, and it would be jamming that communication link to the missile. But sometimes, the enemy would try to attack the SR-71 by launching a missile without any radar guidance. We were coming in off the water, headed inland, and the pilot says, Hey, Reg, look out your right window. And here is what looks like a telephone pole about 150 yards away that's going just straight up. He said, was that close enough? And I said, yeah, that was close enough. Our main defense, if we were fired upon, was increased speed. And we could increase 100 knots, 200 knots in just a matter of seconds, which is a lot of differential in speed for a missile to cope with. Approaching the target area, the RSO would focus on operating the high-tech surveillance equipment. The six different cameras were able to photograph 100,000 square miles in one hour, producing images with such high resolution that a vehicle's license plate could be clearly identified. The surveying capability of the aircraft was fantastic because you're going in a straight line for 2,000 miles. You could look out as far as the horizon goes, and from horizon to horizon, that's what you could survey. For the crews flying in the top 1% of the atmosphere, their perspective of the world was extraordinary. The first thing that you notice that's phenomenal is the change of the sky color. At, at about 60,000 feet, the sky turns a deep indigo steel blue that is so uh, mesmerizing. You just want to look at it, and it, it's fascinating. If I flew the aircraft up near the Arctic Circle, and I might actually traverse dawn to dusk and back two or three times. I've seen the sun rise and set three times on a flight, which is very unusual. I and mean, we're actually flying faster than the Earth's rotation, so we're outrunning the sun. On landing, the highest priority was to download the cameras, called sensors, as quickly as possible. Everyone was deeply concerned that their sensor performed as it was designed to do and programmed to do. So there was a lot of serious concern there, and there was a lot of uh, happiness because the plane had made a successful mission and the crews were home. The films were then rushed off for processing and analysis. Well, the photo interpreters were a, a brilliant bunch of young airmen, and they could look at that film and they could spot something had been moved or a new facility was going up. Um, they, were, they were great at that. And uh, they would call their supervisors if they saw something of interest, you know, that needed to be flagged and brought to the attention of the intelligence people. One of the things I enjoyed about flying the Blackbird was knowing that information is power. The information we would gather could very well preclude bombs having to be dropped at all. It could save a lot of people's lives by having the right information at the right time. The Blackbird crews were successfully infiltrating enemy territory and gathering a massive intelligence about their adversaries. 
But with the Iron Curtain still firmly in place, and Soviet technology constantly improving, how long would the SR-71 remain flying safely in such dangerous areas? In October 1973, they would face their most crucial test. In the early 1970s, the world's attention focused on the Middle East. Tension between America's ally Israel and her Arab neighbors was reaching the breaking point. On October 6, 1973, Soviet-backed Egypt and Syria attacked Israel and made dramatic territorial gains. With the Middle East caught up in the politics of the Cold War, an Israeli defeat would carry the threat of nuclear conflict. The Soviets had launched their Cosmos 596 satellite that relayed immediate intelligence from the battlefronts and put them one step ahead of the United States. It was time to bring in the Blackbird. The SR-71 would fly directly from Griffiths Air Force Base, New York, to the Middle East. The flight would be over 11 hours long, with six refuelings. No Blackbird crew member had ever experienced such a lengthy, complex mission. I flew a ten and a half hour training flight, and I was beat by the time I got out of the airplane. I said, whew, that's about as far as I can fly. But when they said you can fly 11 hours and 20 minutes, you jump up and you say, yes, sir, you know, I'll be happy to do that. I picked Jim Shelton as the first pilot to fly the mission. I knew he was an extremely reliable, highly qualified, and uh, had done extremely well in all of his training and everything. So I had total confidence that if the mission could be done, that Jim uh, would do it. On the 12th of October, under code name Giant Reach, the mission began. We took off from Rome, New York around 1 or 2 in the morning because you want to be over a target area somewhere between 11 and 1 o'clock. This allows you to have some shadows so the photo interpreters can, interpreters can go ahead and judge elevation, but yet get you the best sun position you can have. By 10 o'clock in the morning, the SR-71 had reached its second refueling point over Portugal. Because of the highly classified nature of this mission, no one other than the tanker crew knew they were coming. On the way into that particular refueling, the uh, tanker crews said the Portuguese control kept calling out an airplane in relation to the tanker. And the tanker says, you know, we don't see anybody. Of course, they knew it was us. But I'm sure that they could tell on their scope something was happening because the two blips merge for a while, for 20 minutes, and then this one accelerates on. Jim Shelton approached the Egyptian coastline. The Egyptians were well equipped, with their Soviet allies constantly replenishing their supplies. Russia was developing the SA-5, which was a missile that would go up above, well above your altitude and come back down at you. And yes, that was a concern. With 160 SAM missile sites, many secretly commanded by Soviets, and sophisticated radar tracking systems. They were on full-scale alert, watching the skies for any enemy infiltration. As soon as we got into range of the Egyptian SAM sites, they started tracking us. The Egyptians, alerted to an unidentified aircraft appearing on their radar systems, and presuming the plane to be either Israeli or American, scrambled to launch their surface-to-air missiles. 80,000 feet above them, traveling at a speed of over Mach 3, Jim Shelton's Blackbird was gathering thousands of feet of film, capturing the extent and whereabouts of the Egyptian military forces. You had the radar receiver in the back cockpit. Gary could tell me that, yes, now we're being tracked by some SAM missile. We need to do something. So at that particular point, we would jam, we would speed up. By the time the Egyptian missiles were ready to fire, the SR-71 had already cleared their airspace and was speeding towards Israel. But the heavily armed Israelis also had no knowledge of this covert Blackbird operation and immediately went on full alert. 
when we rolled in on the first pass over Israel, my defensive system just lighted up like a pinball machine. And I indicated to my pilot, I got all these indications back here. I said, just, you know, maybe keep your eyes open because it seems like somebody's shooting at us. Despite launching a barrage of missiles, the Israelis did not manage to shoot their presumed enemy out of the sky. The Blackbird headed back to the United States. We got everything we were tasked for, got the airplane back, and that's the first time the airplane, the SR-71, had flown 11 hours and 20 minutes. After we land, the next couple of days, Gary and I get invited to the Pentagon. Uh, Admiral Moore, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, wanted to thank us for the, the work that we had done, and they showed us some photos. The photographs were detailed enough to show how many Israeli tanks had been destroyed in the initial battles. We were to go ahead and resupply uh, the Israelis with some of their lost equipment. So the photo interpreters are counting the number of tanks that we would be replacing. So it was a very crucial point for the SR-71. It was a very sensitive mission and there was a lot of pressure to get that first one done. Uh, Jim and his backseater nailed them. He got all the, all the targets and everyone was absolutely elated. Eight more successful Blackbird missions supplied detailed intelligence that the war was now turning in Israel's favor. With this information, the United States was able to broker an eventual ceasefire on October 24th. I think the SR-71 contributed greatly to the resolution of that war. No one knew the airplane could fly that far and perform a mission like that and, and come back and, and uh, hand the intelligence people the product. Blackbird was also a record breaker. On September 13, 1974, Kelly Johnson's SR-71 flew in a race with the sun from London to Los Angeles across seven time zones. It took just three hours, 47 minutes, and 39 seconds. For the record-breaking flight, uh, I was over at the FAA Control Center, and uh, the controller is a huge screen, and he said, here's a 747 coming out of Phoenix. And it'd go blip. Blip. It moved about half inch or a quarter inch. He said, okay, get ready. Here comes the SR-71 out of uh, Canada. And it goes, and there goes uh, my antenna. And there goes Idaho. <laughs> and, and get ready. Boom. And uh, it almost blew us out of way because he was right overhead. And uh, he, did, he was starting to decel, but he managed to blow the windows out of Zaza Gore's house in the Hollywood Hills. <laughs> that same year, the Blackbird flew a record-breaking flight from New York.